Yes, Doc, I did some preaching here, and they told me the next time I come, they'll have me a nice glass of sorrel. Let me just make sure I don't jump to conclusion. So, you didn't get the memo, Doc. We're going to pray. So when the sister brought me a bottle, I thought it was going to be red. <laughs> but it was a bottle of water. But uh, that's okay. We're going we're gonna to make, make it happen today. I just want to say I'm happy to be in God's house. I said to you that when I preach, preaching is not for me monologue. It is not just me talking to you. It is dialogue. Because what the Holy Spirit gave to me to give to you Remember, I don't know you and what you have had, what experiences you've had this week. So if I say something that touches a need or satisfy the longing of a prayer, it isn't me. It is the Holy Spirit. You must reassure and reaffirm your faith. And sometimes we leave saying, oh, this preacher was a bad preacher. And this preacher did not do anything but say what God asked him to say. And God used what he said to speak to somebody. Give God the praise and use those moments. And I say to my congregation, use those moments as testimony that God has not forgotten about you. And that God can use anybody to give me what I need when he knows I need it. That is the kind of God we serve. You have chosen wisely to ponder on the seven last words of Jesus. Ellen White says in one of her books, you should let the study of Calvary, the four Gospels, especially the scenes of Jesus' life and his ministry of death. And when you can contemplate on that, you begin to see Jesus for who he really is is you begin to understand and appreciate fully the true extent of his sacrifice it is a text that we use so casually for God so loved the world that he gave his 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 so his gift was special, costly. Some writers said Jesus is and was and will always be the very treasure of heaven. God gave his only begotten that. See, that's the problem when you know the word, the wording, and not the word. Let's go again. That, 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 look at the conflict of meaning. Here is God on the one hand given all that he has. His only, his one and only monogenes. There's no one like him and he gives it for let, let, let me see I'm, that's what I'm trying to tell you you know the wording but sometimes you and this I think preacher this is where we get a little special blessing because when you, we, we know the, 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 the science of hermeneutics a word one word can 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 open a floodgate sometimes read the Bible and focus on each word because you have read that text before, but you never understood what it meant. Only, most costly, he gives it to. Do you know what that, that is like, mom? That's like, that's like, and I'm, and I'm going to be a little crass. That's like a mo the most beautiful woman you could find. But then the word about her is anybody can. Do you understand? Whomever wants it can. 
God is giving his best to the worst. And in, and listen to me now, listen to me now, because by beholding you become change. We have been taught that you only reward the best. If you think I'm lying, you fail, and I know Cowan is an educator, you get all D's in his class and see if you make it to the next level. <laughs> this is the economy of sin. Mary, we only reward the best. But in the economy of grace, in the economy of grace, the worst of us gets the best of and the least of us becomes the greatest of us. And so when we are so steeped into the economy of hypocrisy is what I call it. We only now begin to want to help those who seem to be the best of us. And that's why you have cliques in the church. Elder so-and-so and the pastor so-and-so, sister so-and-so, oh, doctor so-and-so. Those degrees can get you one degree closer to Jesus Christ. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? And we begin to treat each other based upon what we have accumulated. And we get our wires, spiritual wires, crossed. And the worst of us that sinner for whom God gave the best of him, we give the worst of ourselves. And because God has no other picture representation of his character but the church, when you misrepresent God by the way you live, you jeopardize the possibility of a soul being saved. Did you hear? Come with me to Calvary. We will take with us the backdrop that Jesus gives the best of himself. Now he is there on Calvary. Look at him. They have hung him high. And they spread him wide. This is the fifth word. This is an audacious word. It is a word filled with drama. There is intrigue in this word. There is suspense in this word. Because from Pilate's Hall, all throughout the different cycles of torture, the record is he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. That means he offered no resistance. Pilate had said, I find. In Roman law, a sinner, a citizen, an offender can never be brought to justice unless there was a legitimate charge against him. Here is Pilate, the highest official of the state, looking at Jesus and saying, I find no fault. Jesus could have defended himself. That is why Pilate said to him, do you not answer a word? Can't you hear what they are saying about you? Don't you know that if you do not speak for yourself, I have the power to take your life 
or to set it free. And Jesus understands the nuance of law. Had he responded, he would have instantaneously been set off. Had he responded, what could he have said? For he only spoke truth. His only response would have been, they are lying. And had he said that, since there was no evidence to refute it, he would have gone home. And so he is quiet. The question that is asked tonight, what is Jesus doing on the cross? When Pilate says, I have found no fault in him, why must he die? Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon that tree. Amazing pity. Amazing pity. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond decree. One songwriter tried to grapple with it and he cried out, oh, he was trying to calculate the depth of Jesus' love. He was trying to use mathematical equations to see if he can find the square root of love, to see if he can find the x of everlasting love and he got so frustrated Chris he said ah oh, the heights depths of mercy length and breadth of he is on the cross He is hung by his wrists. And the torture of the Roman cross was to suspend you in midair, holding only to be held up by your body's weight. So there's Jesus. And he is straining for oxygen. And his lips are dry. And when he swallows, there is no saliva because he is dry to the bone. He has been suffering this stuff all week and merry. The record is that he ascended into heaven and he descended into hell. Let, 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 let's, let's, let us use our imagination here. Do you remember the story of the, of the, the man Lazarus, the rich man Lazarus who was in hell? And he was being tormented by... Do you know what was his main problem? He was, somebody said it, he was thirsty. And he said to God, give me, Abraham, give me a drink of water. Listen to me now. Let, let's use our theological mindset. So here is Jesus. The record is he ascended to heaven and he descended into hell. If his soul is in the depth of hell, we, it, it is not too far-fetched to believe that he is also thirsty in this environment. And he cries out, I thirst. And he did not just say, I thirst. Understand, before he could have said that, he had to gather enough, enough strength, the balance, the pain that rips through every muscle and fiber and, and, and he says I'm, I'm, I'm thirsty come with me is it okay if I take a little time because I want you to understand they, 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 I told you that there was intrigue and drama at Calvary. Well, the record, this was not the first. When, when he said he was thirsty, what did they do? Can you remember? The soldiers gave him soured wine. Well, let me ask you a question. Remember I told you, preaching for me is not, is not monologue. Talk to me. 
What did you think when the soldiers offered him that wine? What did you think? They're cruel. Do you agree with her? Talk to me now. You thought it was an act of cruelty that they gave him wine. Soured wine. Okay, now let's, let's, let's look at it. Because there, 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 there is some historical data that you're missing. I thought the same way too. It was not the first time he was offered wine. It was the tradition in Jewish custom when a man is condemned to die, women would bring him a bottle of wine dipped with hyssop. Franklin says. Why Franklin says? Does anybody know? Franklin says when taken in at a certain concentration with wine causes an aesthetic effect. That just means it numbs you up. So when they offered the condemned man, Jesus, a little wine with Franklin sense. It was not an act of cruelty. They knew that the crucifixion process was a long, laborious, and painful, so out of mercy for the condemned, they had offered him wine twice. And Jesus had said, no. He had to say no because to take frankincense and wine to numb the pain would have been an easy way out for a savior. Had he off, had he taken that preacher, Isaiah could never have written bruise for beaten the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his oh that whip that ripped the flesh of Jesus had from it his own precious blood when we dip our bruised souls in that fountain we emerge whole and healed couldn't take it because he was a willing offering he had offered up himself willingly this was the only way without the shedding of blood there can be no remission this is not the blood of bulls and goats and rams now the old Levitical order is now about to be wiped clean Jesus Paid it all. Do not condemn the soldier. The second offering of wine was what the soldier did. And that is called Posca wine. What type of wine did I say, Elder? Posca. P O S C A. Posca wine. Posca wine. That's what the soldier offered him. The soldier dipped it in sponge and we thought it was an act of cruelty. Have you ever been in the intensive care unit and a man is dying and he wants to, and he's under ventilator and he wants water and you can't give him water but you dip a sponge with coal and you wet his lips. It was an act of mercy. This soldier had himself been convicted that this man who is condemned to die, there was something different about him. And never, whenever you look at Jesus, you're going to find something different about him. There is something different about this condemned man, preacher. Look at the dignity with which he dies. He is not fussing. He is not cussing. He, we know he is guiltless. Because Pilate, our commander, says there is no fault in him. So when Jesus says, I'm, I'm thirsty. It was the act of another soldier reaching out to another warrior. But look at this now. Poscar wine was made from soured grapes. Normally when grape is fermented to 11 to 12% alcohol, you have a nice wine. 
but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> preacher, oh, I almost got them, preacher. I almost got them. <laughs> Almost got them. So we know why some of you don't make it out to prayer meeting. <laughs> but with Pasco wine, the, the, the scholars tell us that is wine that has been left in the open. Acetic acid forms with that wine as it's oxygenated and it becomes sour. The Roman soldier used that wine to quench thirst and it was often thought to be more effective than water in quenching thirst. That Pasco wine, they tell us that when Roman soldiers went to territories to do war and the water was stink and, 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 and musty and, and, and green, they would put Pasco wine with that and quench their thirst. They, what was Pasco wine doing at Calvary? They were prepping themselves for a long day of torture and they knew they were going to be tired as soldiers and it was there for their own consumption. So when Jesus declared, I'm thirsty, he's hanging without hands. They couldn't give him a cup. How else could he get some water but to, the sponge for a soldier back in the day was used to pad his helmet. The sponge for a soldier was used so that it could be a pillar. It was used to clean. When he gave Jesus his sponge, he gave him his own personal utensil. Don't be too quick to judge this soldier. There is intrigue at Calvary. So when Jesus declared, I am thirsty, do we give him the best? that we have to slake the thirst of the Savior. And he dipped that Pascal wine, fill it with sponge, and he is doing his part to help a dying Savior. I thirst. Why did Jesus say I thirst? Well, there was another school of thought. The Gnostics say, you have accepted a wrong Jesus. Because if he, if he is God, he cannot hurt, bleed, die, suffer. Their view of God is a power that cannot be killed. We understand. We view God that way too. So they argued, if Jesus is God and he can't die, then you are worshiping a false savior. Jesus understands the school of thought, says, I thirst is an expression of his physical need. That not only is he God, but he is God in the flesh. That is why John would write in that century, any spirit who does not accept and testify that Jesus has come in the flesh is antichrist. You got to put the dots together. So when Jesus declared, I am thirsty, he is saying, I am human. I am suffering. I am touched with the feelings of your infirmity, but I can be God and fully man and fully dead for you. So that cry of I thirst is not only a need for water, it's an affirmation of his divinity and his humanity. I thirst. I'm almost done. Why is he saying I'm thirsty? Understand that before Calvary, Jesus had not known what it was to be separated from the Father. That unity. And, and the closest thing to that unity is the institution of marriage. Doc, I know you know what I'm about. I'm talking to married folks now. I remember when I was a freshman at Oakwood College, we went for the RAs. We had a retreat. Never forgot my dean, Dean Teddy Gunn. He would stay up all night. He wouldn't go to sleep. So, you know, as fellas, we were getting hot. I said, Dean, come on, man, you're soft. 
your wife is not here, you're not sleeping. And he said, fellas, let me tell you something. I've been married to this woman for so long. I don't travel without her because I can't sleep without the warmth of her embrace beside me. And you know, we thought it was being a soft man. You but when you are locked in like that in holy where it match, you don't want to be too, that kind that distance is 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 painful. You you don't want to have fun when your spouse is not with you. You 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 want to go home. The folks at the office are like, let's go have a drink. I mean, let's have a drink. I got a wife home waiting for me. Well, let's go do this. I can't, I'm full with that, man. I, even if I did it, I won't enjoy it. That, that, that unity, that unity. Jesus is now experiencing that unity for the first, this unity for the first time. Whatever was put together in Bethlehem is coming asunder at Calvary. And the Godhead must now experience this unity. They had never felt this way before. That is why the record said when Jesus, when God the Father, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood, and he cried out, Daddy! You must understand what that means like to be a father, to hear your daughter or your son calls to you in emergency mode. Everything about you stands up and, and, and listen to me. The record is women have been known to lift cars by themselves when that cry is uttered. I saw one clip on YouTube where a woman went into a pond and opened the, the, the mouth of a crocodile and... and <laughs> kid you not to get her child there was something within us as parents as and women you have it stronger than we do look at Jesus in Gethsemane daddy and look at what he's saying if it be possible talking about thirsty let this cup do you understand what Jesus was asking his father? He's saying, is there, Nikki, anything in the mind of God, anything, and this, which is an unlimited mind, is there anything in the, in the brilliance of God? Can there be a second plan that I don't have to do this? Can God come up with another way in the mind of God so that he can save the human family? And God says, uh-uh, boy, you've got to drink this cup it's either you love him enough to drink it or you don't love him and you leave him you can't pussyfoot your way out of this you gotta love him and save him or leave him you understand why god can't take lukewarm christians and that's that is a that is an oxymoron a lukewarm christian i mean And Jesus said to his father, are you sure there is no other way? Uh-uh, boy. You better love him and go or leave him and let them die. And the, the record is that God, Jesus took the cup. And do you know what that cup represents? You ought to know because you are Jamaicans. Most of you, there, there's a saying in Jamaica that every tub got to do what? Sit on its own. That means you've got a sin cup. And you've got a sin cup. And you've got a sin cup. You've got a sin cup, and I've got a sin cup, and only God and you know what's in your sin cup. And every human being, past, present, and future, has a sin cup. And God, the righteous judge, has to take every body's mess and misery and all the iniquity that you have ever and will ever commit, every human being and even the devil's sin cup and he pours it into one cup and he brings it into Gethsemane and he says what will you do boy you don't I told you there was drama around this you thought I was joking and Jesus is down and bended knees it was so heavy the record is he was sweating blood that means 
the cellular membrane could no longer contain its own composure it burst open don't you understand that only happens when you are come exposed to a certain amount of pressure and we said back home pressure what boss pike brethren you think this had your business and Jesus is on the pressure so much so that he begins to sweat blood and he takes the cup and he says not my will but thine be and he drink the cup that's why the wreck John says Jesus knowing that all had been fulfilled now he says I'm He had already gone through the phase. At this moment, this was the precise moment when the father turned from him. Oh, you don't know what that means. Like, when we study diseases, maybe when we treat them, and we go into the sick and the broken, with AIDS, I'm talking to medical professionals now. You don't go in there without your hands gloved up and you. Somebody have TB, a mask up, doc. You don't want anything that they have to touch you and to bring it to your family. This is Jesus now. He is going to cure the epidemic of sin, not by staying outside of it, but the record is, oh my God, the only way to cure that, God made him who knew no sin. You don't even understand what that means. God made him who knew no sin to become sin itself. And when you are sin, you are automatically separated from God. So the moment he was transformed into an offering of sin, God has to treat him like sin. And so God turns his back on him. Doc, that's like you hearing your daughter knocking on the door, your son, daddy. She has become somebody, he has become somebody you didn't raise him or her to become. And you, all that is inside of you that is apparently wants to open the door. But all that is righteous has to say, I can't. My God! Understand when he said that. He was talking personally to his father. That is to be translated. Dad! That's Joshua calling to you, Nigel. Well, a boat is sinking and you have the only vessel. And he's, he's on his last breath and he's calling. And you are looking at him. But you got to turn away. God could not even continue to look. Because had he continued to look, God could not contain God's self. Daddy! Why? Why? That, you must understand he had never known this emotion. He had said to his disciple, if you have seen me, you have seen. The father and I are one. Paul would later say God was in Christ reconciling the world. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily so when he walked he does not walk by himself he is walking as God with God in company with himself <laughs> That's a, a. doc how much time do I have here okay. why do you now forsake me when I am at my weakest God has to treat Jesus that way so that when you come, you are never to be treated that way. Jesus had to be abandoned so that when you come, no matter how you come, he can in no wise cast you out. Did you hear what I said? 
So Jesus is now fully sin. He has descended into the depths of hell. He has just tasted the Pascal wine. And it is from that that he draws the last gasp of humanity. Because divinity is about to be separated from humanity. Understand, because God is God, God can't die. God is life. How are you going to kill the life giver? So in order for him, in order for the body to die, the divinity has to now leave. And it is at the moment of its departure that Jesus understands what it means to be separated from the Father. He now truly understands the, 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 the thirsty nature of sin. And so when he is by himself, he cries out, I'm thirsty. Not for physical drink, did he not say to the woman of the well, what did he say to the woman of the well? Talk to me. Huh? If you drink of this water, the stuff that I have coursing through my veins, the power that I can deposit into your life, you may, t you may chase after earthly things. You may chase after temporary pleasures. You may chase after the desires of your heart, but you will always be thirsty. Those things can't fill you. I am the fountain of living water. I am that well from which you drink and you will never thirst again because when you taste and see that the Lord is good, something starts to happen. Something reprograms the dynamics of your soul and you are never the same again. Jesus now feels the separation from the Father. He is alone. He, he cannot get access to heaven. It is shut off from him. God has to treat him like sin. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? Maybe a parent in here. Only, I guess only parents can understand this. Grandparents. If you have raised a child and you want to do right by the child but 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 the child won't receive it so you have to leave the child out there to suffer the consequences and you have to treat the child the way the child is going and it is not a pleasant thing for doc you want to go out there but you can't god couldn't even turn to look at his son he could had he turned Had he turned, couldn't even, it was so bad that God had to sh shut out the light. Because he is everywhere at the same time. He couldn't help seeing, even if he had turned west, he still eats. So he had to shut out the light. And everything in nature was made to praise the name of Jesus. So when he shut out the light, the birds hush. Because every echo would be echoing the name that he has to forget. Don't you understand what it means when he cried out, I'm thirsty. long for the come and it, it had not even gone on for two hours that separation and how often we stay so far away from God not coming back for connection not coming back for wholeness not coming back for forgiveness thinking that we're doing this on our own self not knowing Ellen White says that at that moment the devil wants to snuff you out so that you are lost but even when you are in your rebellious state God is still protecting you night and day all night all day angels watching over me why because his banner over you is love god will not make it 
easy for you to be lost. He has spent too much to purchase you. Are you kidding me? That I messed around and saw these shoes for less than fifty dollars, and I bought them. But you know, I shine that stuff up, and I didn't even pay that much for it. Keep the. Did you hear what I said? Can you imagine the God of heaven? Hey, that's why they say He goes. Look at Him going into the. The, the dump heap of life put in his hand in the stinking effigy of our mistakes searching for you finding you and knocking on the heart's door that's cause he's thirsty that's cause he's thirsty don't you ever think that God will leave a sinner because he is a sinner. The prerequisite for grace is that you are a sinner. And some of us have made the prerequisite for salvation that you're a vegetarian. That you don't wear makeup. That you know everything Ellen White ever said. And that you worship on Saturdays. And some of you are so wicked, you wouldn't even turn on the stove and boil a little tea on the Sabbath. To warm your body. To come to church and praise God. You leave home cool. Trying to impress people and your body and your spirit is cold. And you bring a cold spirit here. And iron can't sharpen iron because you are aluminum. And when you put iron next to aluminum, yo, yo. Can I see it, Elder? And let me close with this. Let me close with this. Preacher, I can almost guarantee you to a certain bet of my life, I would wager my life if any one of you were, were at Calvary and Jesus had said, I'm thirsty, you would be the first to try to slake that thirst. You would want to be there to help him, wouldn't you? I'm gonna mess you up now. The difference between the righteous and the religious is their attitudes towards the broken and the bruised. Do you remember Mary, Jesus, talks about that scene when he is dealing out judgment. And this is what hypocrisy is a terrible thing, you know. Let me tell you something. When the Bible says many shall come to me in that day and say, did we not? Do you understand what that means? That's hypocrisy. That is Satanism. Because after Jesus has said it is finished, you are saying you are lying on me, Jesus, because you did not give me the just reward for my work. Do you understand when you challenge Jesus in the day of judgment, you are saying that he is wrong? They didn't get it, preacher. That's why the Bible says, and that's the most scary text in the Bible, many shall come to me on that day. And they will rehearse their religious acts. Well, didn't we cast out? Preacher, I don't know about you. It is a tough thing to cast out a devil. So if you can run a devil and still be lost, you must be such a hypocrite. And there are a lot of them in the church. Hypocrisy is knowing that what you're doing is wrong, but refusing to change because of pride. And look at how terrible this is. The Bible says many. 
that means you are going to be in church doing the right things for the wrong reasons. So caught up in your religiosity that you have forsaken and abandoned your righteousness, which is the righteousness of God. So you are trusting in your activity and God is concerned about your ontology. Busy worrying about the product. When you should be concerned and invested in the process. When I was a young boy, I'd be a sister in the church. I don't find anybody in the world can bake like her. Sister Helen Romeo. She makes a mean black cake. And I would always be worried as I used to go there to help her and she used to cater. And I would always be worried about how it's going to come out, how the thing is going to look. And she said, well, you're worried about the product. I'm the one baking it. When Jesus is controlled, and when Jesus is in control of the process, the product is inevitably going to be what God has designed it to be. Too many of us are expecting people to be what you want them to be. And not what God wants them to be. And if you are filled with the love of Christ, you will know how to steer that soul. I'm getting somewhere now because I told you I'm closing. If Jesus was, if you were at Calvary, you would have been the first to say, here is a glass of water, Jesus. But Jesus is saying, and I was taking you down a road to get to this point. In as much as you have done it unto the You have done it unto me. Well, what do you mean, Jesus? Jesus says, well, I was hungry. That's what it means to be thirsty. And you gave me bread. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. That's what he says to the righteous. I was homeless. And you opened a homeless shelter in the back of your church so that the broken and the bruised. I was strung out on drugs. And you designed a detox program that incorporated the principles of health and principles of righteousness. I was in prison. And your church formed a prison ministry where you came in there to capture the broken and the bruised. I was a homosexual. And you brought the gospel to me and the power of salvation. Why you say, Emil? I was a murderer and you brought me to the life giver. I was a prostitute and you made me to feel like I was somebody. I'm thirsty is what Jesus is saying. Look around your community. That depravity you see is the echo of Jesus' thirst. What will you do about it? That soldier gave Pasco wine on a sponge to a dying savior. It was the best that he has. What has God given you? Some of you are doctors and nurses, nurse practitioners, teachers, educators, pastors, lawyers. What will you do with your Pasco wine? There are people out there who are on the verge of mental depression. Doc, there are people who would rather go to a psychic than to come to a pastor. People who are going to clubs and walking past our churches and you don't blame them. Let me shock you. And, and let me tell you something. This thing just Doc, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there is a movement in our churches amongst our pathfinders. They are trying out the homosexual and the lesbian lifestyle. Did you know that? See, the reason you don't know that is because you're not out there. When we were coming up, 
every club, pathfinders, MV, our parents were right there. Overnight hikes, we had them, we were talking, they knew what we were thinking and they were able to correct us. We don't spend time with our young people. As a matter of fact, you probably don't even come to AY. When you tell them they are not even worth your time, what do you think they're going to think of what's happening here? If they don't even invest some time in my spiritual development, it's a waste of time. And you won't if you're not on the righteous path. A buddy of mine in ministry called me. He said, Newton, you wouldn't believe. He said a parent called him and was crying because her son had just married a homosexual. This was a young man who had walked in the church, was a pathfinder. Listen to me now, listen to me now. This is what he said, the mother said, the young, when he asked her, why did you do that? You came up in the church. He said, yes, I grew up in the church, but I have no respect for the church. He said, when I came to pathfinders, they would always tease me and they would tell me that I'm too feminine. Their parents would tell them not to talk to me. None of them were my friends. I never felt welcome. Some of the same homosexuals brought him into their circles. And he said he felt so loved. He felt so accepted that he stopped going to church and hanging out with his homosexual peers. And, and, and that stuff just left. How? How? And if I'm idealistic in my thinking, then preacher, maybe what I have of God and God's people, maybe is wrong. There is no way a sinner should not feel more comfortable here than... Just no. No, no, no. It, I, I, I can't wrap it around my mind. But when you look at some of the brutality with which we treat each other, you can understand why some folks will never come back in our churches. And they are thirsty looking for answers in all the wrong places. This young man said, I was made to feel more. Ac and this is how the devil works. Chris, he is going to make the people who profess to be Christians treat you the worst. Because if you're looking at them, You are low-hanging fruit in the spiritual battle. You are easy, you are soft target. God doesn't have soft targets, man. If, 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 if your focus is on Jesus, then it doesn't matter what she does. Your eyes are on Jesus, and you are following the Jesus way. But not everybody is that strong. That's why when, when bright lights go out, a lot of you will follow them. Because you have invested in a religion and not in a relationship. And it is high time that you understand what we are about as a movement. God is not with those who don't know how to unite just because you have different ethnic backgrounds. You have the white work, the Haitian work, the bad, the bad, the foolishness, and the Spanish work, and the West Indian, and the African. And the world is looking at us who can't even come together. And you're talking about you're going to heaven? Stop with a madness in there, brother. And nobody is willing to speak a word to power. God is waiting for his church. I am tired of hearing about the new world order. And yes, it's there. 
It's in place. It is God who is holding back the four winds of strife. And these people have invested all of their resources into that one final movement. Do you know what that one fi final movement is? They are going to mimic the coming of Christ when the devil descends. And the Bible says, if it were possible, all of these movies, all of these shows are getting you ready for that. And the people of God are so caught up in entertainment that they have missed the enlightenment. And the devil is waiting to do a dastardly deed. God has also said, in these days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So let them boy plan and do whatever they do, brethren. If God is for us, <laughs> who? Who? You don't understand the kind of God you serve, man. If never back down, never back out, never tired, never lose, never soft. You understand the kind of God? We, we have to remind each other who we serve. Jesus is saying to the church, I am thirsty. There are people in here wrestling with demons and they can't find peace because they don't know how to bring that stuff to the church and their lives are being tormented. Generational curses are running amok in some families. and People are riddled with diseases and the Bible has given the church the prescription for curing. Is there any sick amongst you? Let him call. What if the elder them now live right to your call? Hey? The elder them not living right, who you're calling? And I'm talking to my young people now because you have no excuse. God says, I called you because you are strong. You have a certain strength about your mind. God uses that kind of us. You see how Peter was? People thought that Peter was a... Yo. <laughs> Preacher, we know Peter always carried him thing. Yeah. I'm doing a run for dry thoughts, you know. <laughs> Trap off a boy right in front of God. <laughs> you understand? Peter, you understand what Peter... Peter was not... Yo, Peter is a rough boy scout. Peter is with the Lord. And Peter ain't thing. I said, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, you, go, you think a joke? Look, but but, but I, I, we're laughing, but, but look at what God uses. God knew Peter was so committed to his role as an assassin that if God can put that, uh, that commitment into righteousness. Do you, do you see what? Sometimes we look at the broken and the bruised and we see their activity and not their potential. This man is a liar. But if we can get him turned on to the truth preacher, he's a mouthpiece for God. This woman is easy. But if we can get her to value the God in her, then she's a magnet to draw people to Christ. Look at what Jesus did to the prostitute that armed the woman at the well. And she run back and said, come! Yeah. Wouldn't believe. Let me say, what's your top? Most man story. See this man here? That's all she knew. So she told Jesus had to reach her. We're scum. I'm a man for sure. The world I know. So convincing that people say, no, I'm going to see what this mad lady is talking So sometimes we look at the faults of people. Look at Paul. Wicked boy that, you know. Brilliant preacher. Get you in an argument and turn you around upside down. And next thing you know, the boy, must stone you in the backyard. On his way to kill more Christians. Because he believed what he was doing. And God said, you know what? The man there. He said, boy. okay. Let him meet me. Oh, and let me tell you something. When you introduce them to Christ, when they meet Christ, you can't change them night. 
we bring them to the person who can change them. That is why Jesus is saying, I'm thirsty, bring a soul. Like Jamaican say when they want to touch a button there. <laughs> bring a sinner here, bring a sinner. Let me say this before you come. Come. Yeah. Jesus is saying, I'm thirsty. Yeah. This is my final. If you have not gotten anything from this sermon, and I will come and make the appeal after he sings. Jesus is saying, I'm thirsty. Because he understands he is our substitute. Whatever he has gone through, he has done it so that I don't have to go through that. It's like we tell, it's like I tell my daughter when I came here, worked three jobs in college. My brother knows because we used to do the same thing. Hustle, full day, full night job and full day hustling but when she went to Oakwood they had to pay her because what I did paved the way for what she was going she didn't have to do what I did so she just walked right through so when Jesus says to the father I am thirsty it is a final recognition that whatever these sinners have done. These who are the apple of mine eye. I have become that. You have punished me for them. Now open the flood gates of righteousness. I am thirsty. And Jesus knows at the end of probation. There are going to be two groups of people. Those who are thirsty. And those whose thirst. Have been quenched. Jesus has come to Huntington as the fount of every blessing. Every blessing. And he's saying, drink. Drink of me. It does not matter what you have done. How long you have done it. When was the last time you did it? Drink. I did not spill so much blood so that you can continue in sin. The wages of sin is death. But there is a gift of God that gives eternal life.